True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. As far back as Brian Stidham could remember, he wanted to be a doctor and work with children. As an exceptional student, he graduated from Harvard Medical School. Then he began his residency in pediatric ophthalmology. Eventually, Brian married, had children, and moved to Tucson, Arizona. As one of very few specialists in the area, he was in high demand. But as Brian's star was rising, his life would be taken by a man whose own life was crashing and burning. Join us at the quiet end for Eye to Eye, the murder of Dr. Brian Stidham. While working at a practice with ophthalmologist Bradley Schwartz, Brian noticed that the doctor was behaving very erratically. After Schwartz was indicted on drug charges, Brian made plans to open his own practice. But Schwartz was infuriated when his patients went to Brian, and Brad Schwartz was not the forgiving type. So that's where the trouble begins. What have we got for a beer? We have an Arizona beer from Tempe, uh, Four Peaks Brewing Company's Peach Ale. It's a golden ale. So this is what's considered a field and fruit beer. Not very highly alcoholic. Um, Pretty good. Clear gold color, small white head, nice aroma, some fruit and flowers. Definitely peachy taste. Really noticeable. Light-bodied, very refreshing. Good for the hot summers around here. Okay. It was kind of serendipitous that you decided you wanted some summer beers. And you picked up a mixed 12-pack by Four Peaks, mm-hmm. and this was one of them. Oh, cool. And this was before I had figured out that you were doing this case. So Pretty neat. But, you know, I'm not too thrilled with fruity beers, 4.5%. Eh, it's huh. okay. Oh, you laugh at that. Oh, please. <laughs> Let's open some up and drink them. It is a warm day. All right, Dickie, come on down here and let's start this talk. Okay, I'll lead us off. You ready? I'm ready. So, David Brian Stidham grew up in the 70s in Longview, Texas. His parents were ambitious people, and his goals were always accepted and supported. Now, he was named after his uncle David, but he was never called David. He was always Brian. (laughs) Yeah, we'll name him after Uncle David, but we're not going to call him David. Well, sometimes those things just kind of happen, though. You start calling them by their middle name, and then that's where you are. I guess so. Yeah, but when he was growing up, he made friendships that would really last him a lifetime. For Brian, his closest circle of friends got together in the eighth grade, and they would say whatever Brian put his mind to, he accomplished. For example, he really didn't have any musical talent, but he worked really hard at it, and he was able to become the drummer in a middle school band. Yeah, and by the time he was a freshman in high school, everybody knew that he was going to be a doctor. By pursuing a career in medicine, Brian was going to be following a family tradition. His namesake uncle was a physician, as was his grandfather. But it wasn't just that. Apparently, he had a calling. So he he felt that this was something meant for him, be a physician. Getting good grades, nothing to it. Not for Brian. Now, after he and his best friend, Dwayne, graduated high school in 1985, they moved to Nashville together. Brian was enrolled in Vanderbilt University, and Dwayne went to nearby Belmont. The two friends saw each other a lot during their early college years, but college graduation would change that. Brian left Nashville to go to Harvard for med school, and not just attend med school, he fast-tracked med school and completed the program in just three years. Yeah, that impresses me. (laughs) Impresses me, too. Yeah. Now, afterwards, Brian entered the residency program for internal medicine at Texas Southwestern Medical School. That's in Dallas. One year after arriving in Dallas, he made the switch from internal medicine to ophthalmology. He told his friends that he went into pediatric ophthalmology because it meant fewer emergency calls at night 
And of course, he really did love to work with children. So once he was living in Dallas, Brian met an attractive young neighbor, and her name was Daphne Herding. They got along right from the start, became friends, became running partners, and then the relationship turned romantic. After two years together as a couple, they were engaged, and they were married in May of 1997, and they had a great honeymoon in Hawaii. After the honeymoon, the Nulioids moved to Indianapolis, Indiana. Brian took a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus. So true strabismus is uh, eye muscle misalignment, cross-eyed, uh, wall-eyed. One eye is looking at you, the other eye is looking somewhere else. Sure. So, and the problem with that is if, if you have that type of issue, your uh, bad eye gets lazier and lazier and you just actually end up losing vision. So you'd like to identify that early and correct it so that people end up with regular binocular vision with depth perception. Well, sure. So, and then after a year in Indiana, Brian and Daphne returned to Texas, and Brian joined the faculty at the University of Texas in Houston. They welcomed the baby boy to their family in 2000. His name was Alexander. And then in 2003, they would add a daughter to the family, and this was Catherine Elizabeth. So Brian was content with his family, but he continued to want to grow professionally. So he was always open to new opportunities, always looking around. So when there was an ad in a trade journal for a position in Tucson, Arizona, it caught his eye, and Brian was excited. The ad was for a pediatric eye surgeon to work in an already established practice. The surgeon who ran this ad was Dr. Bradley Schwartz. So tell me a little bit about Bradley. Brad Schwartz had arrived in Arizona back in September of 1998. He had plans to open a large chain of eye clinics in Phoenix, and along with his own private practice in Tucson. They were, what, about 120 miles apart, something like that. Now, Tucson was a growing community at the time. There was only a handful of pediatric ophthalmologists. Now, what Brad might not have known when he joined the Arizona Pediatric Eye Specialist Group that's APES. Apes for short. And what, what he did find out when he joined the group is that the Tucson ophthalmologist didn't want some young upstart Phoenix operation opening within their city limits. Sure. You've got to protect your turf, right? Exactly, yes. So Carrie DeLorme was assigned by the APES's founder to help Brad establish his Tucson office. Brad arrives in the community. He's pretty aggressive about building a practice. He wants to meet, talk to all those people that are there, make his presence known, because he's going to succeed. He's going to succeed no matter what. And with the financial backing of apes, that's fairly easy for him. So one of Carrie's responsibilities in setting up the office was to set up credentials with insurance plans. This was a real challenge with Brad because he would lose his temper and end up screaming over the phone with representatives. Carrie got used to this with him, and she even got used to him leaving vulgar messages with her about insurance matters. No doctor wants someone sitting behind a desk telling a surgeon what he can and can't do. Once when this happened, Brad said that he could kill the man over the phone because he was so furious. Carrie reported this call to APES, and they filed a harassment claim against Brad on her behalf. <laughs> so he's starting out already showing some red flags. That's for sure. This may have been the beginning of his expulsion from apes. After his contract expired in a year, he was out. Didn't last long. He wasn't renewed. But it seemed just fine with Brad. He made plans to open his own practice, Arizona Specialty Eye Care. Now, the problem for Brad was that his contract with APES had a clause in it that he wouldn't open an office within a certain distance of where APES had opened its office. So Brad went ahead and defied this by opening his own office in August of 1999, one month before his contract expired. And this was in the very same neighborhood. So APES sued Schwartz in court, and both sides did eventually settle. Well, it's pretty standard stuff to have a non-compete clause in your contract. Yeah, and it was going to be up in a month, so I don't see why he didn't just wait. Well, the other thing is that Non-compete clauses are pretty much impossible to defend. So they might be in the contract, but if you ever 
brought suit against someone because of it, you're probably not going to win. Well, there was a settlement of some kind. I have no idea how much or how little. Yeah, that's true. But yeah. he kept, kept his office in Tucson, didn't he? He certainly did, yes. Okay. With the patient load Brad had built up with APES, plus being the only local ophthalmologist in Tucson who worked with ear, nose, and throat doctors and neurosurgeons to remove tumors of the brain, sinuses, and eye sockets, Brad had no trouble setting up his own practice. Basically, he was in demand. Docs needed him. Absolutely he was. He was a good surgeon. And he also agreed to treat some patients without insurance for free. Well, yeah, <laughs> we all do that. Well, sure. His pro bono work also extended across the border. He came involved with a group called Helping Hands. This all-volunteer group set up a monthly clinic across the U.S.-Mexico border to bring modern medicine to children. Brad seemed happy to be able to use his abilities to help children in need. Very good. Some of the Mexican women wove a beautiful tapestry for him as a gift, and he proudly displayed it in his office. Yeah, and Brad also became the official ophthalmologist for the Arizona State Schools for the Deaf and Blind, and he volunteered his services at the VA Medical Center. His community involvement also extended into his life with his family. As a former Eagle Scout, Brad got his son into Cub Scouts, and he also became active in his children's schools. But then Brad had dental issues, and they intensified shortly after he started his practice. Because he couldn't chew properly, he lost a lot of weight. Also, in addition to managing a busy schedule at work, Brad had to fit in his own medical and dental appointments, which proved pretty challenging. So he was desperate, he was tired, he was in pain. And that's when he turned to illegal prescriptions for Vicodin for the pain and Ritalin for his self-diagnosed attention deficit disorder. I was going to ask you who diagnosed that. Now this would come back to haunt him though. Within one year, Brad began to have sharp pains in his right shoulder and numbness in his fingers that would lead him to have spinal surgery and probably made him more reliant on the drugs. So what's this, like a disc compression thing? Some kind of shoulder and numbness. I would, I would think that he's got a disc problem. Okay. And he's going to have surgery. Okay. Then in 2000, Brad and his wife Joan had their third child, Danielle. By then, though, their marriage was in trouble. Some would say that the marriage was doomed from the start because of Brad's constantly wandering eye. The marriage really deteriorated quite rapidly after the family moved to Tucson. Yeah, it was in 2001 when Joan first filed for divorce. This was after she caught Brad being intimate with another woman. The other woman was Lourdes Lopez, who was a prosecutor with yeah. the Pima County Attorney's Office. Lourdes first met Brad after she brought her foster daughter to him to treat her crossed eyes back in December of 2000. The attraction was immediate, she would say. They began talking on the phone, became friends, and then started dating. But he was still married. He certainly was. And during this time, despite all that's going on here, Brad's practice was continuing to grow and actually flourish. Despite whatever the local medical community thought about Brad as a person, his specialty was in great demand. Many local physicians referred patients to Arizona Specialty Eye Care. By the summer of 2001, Brad had almost more patients than he could handle, and he was making over $2 million a year. He was featured in an article in the Tucson Citizen for his part in treating a toddler whose parents had taken him to see Brad, thinking he had a lazy eye. And on that visit, Brad had discovered something much worse, a cancerous tumor which covered the boy's right eye. So the tumor was removed, the boy was fitted for a prosthetic eye, and he was cancer-free. And, of course, the boy's parents saw Brad as a hero. Yeah, he made the proper diagnosis, saved the kid's life. Brad was able, for a time, uh, to quit taking Vicodin. His own doctor had suggested prescribing painkillers even stronger and more addictive than Vicodin, but Brad refused them. Then when he had spine surgery in November 2001, he took as few prescription pills as he needed, and he stopped taking them at all only two days after the surgery. And with a clear head, Brad was able to focus on how he could expand his business, which would include doing some plastic surgery. So the first step Brad decided was to find someone to take over the pediatric portion of the practice 
and then he could concentrate on adults. So that's when Brad took out an ad for a pediatric ophthalmologist. Yes, so Brian Stidham saw this ad as his opportunity to move his career forward. Brian's wife Daphne was reluctant to move away from her family and home state, but she couldn't help but notice how excited Brian was about Tucson. Brian gushed about Tucson's mountains and parks where he could go hiking and enjoy nature, and he especially loved a popular area called Sabino Canyon in the foothills of the Catalinas. The most beautiful things in life are free, love and family and nature, Brian said. So Daphne agreed to move to Tucson. What are you going to say to that? I know. Very convincing. And their plan was to spend the rest of their lives there. They really liked it there. After Brian was hired on by Brad Schwartz, he wasted no time in becoming a really vital part of the practice. While Brad still saw some young patients, because of his specialty in neuro-ophthalmology, Brian did have a full schedule. Brian's obvious love for children endeared him to their anxious parents, and he set the children at ease with colorful hats and dad jokes. Brian's casual demeanor did clash with Brad's more formal style, however. More than once, Brad criticized Brian for wearing surgical scrubs when he wasn't in surgery. Brad preferred to wear a dress shirt and tie, believing this projected a more professional appearance. He told Brian he should dress similarly, but Brian was just more comfortable in sneakers and scrubs. He also felt that it made him more approachable to his patients, so they disagreed on that. Well, I would say it doesn't make a bit of difference. Well, you can say that, yes, but some people believe that you should, you know, wear yeah. a suit and tie. But I yeah, I agree with you. I don't see the difference it would make. I'll give you anecdotal reports. Okay. Because I would, nine months of the year, I would pretty much wear a tie and a shirt, dress shirt and tie to work seeing patients. Summers was all Hawaiian shirts. I had some really loud ones. So, and nobody, nobody said, oh, I prefer the shirt and tie or the Hawaiian shirt. We did yeah. fine. Well, that's a little bit more dress than wearing scrubs, though. Not really. No? no? Well, I think it kind of is. But I also think when you're working with children, they probably prefer the colorful. Because well, what you didn't mention is you always wore very colorful ties. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. Goofy ties. Exactly, yes. So you weren't very formal. No, that's true. No, but I, I think there is something to be said about children enjoying the colorful, more laid-back appearance. But the problem was that Brad didn't stay off of the Vicodin for long. Set deep into his addiction, he decided to take his care into his own hands. It didn't take much to convince Lourdes to help Brad out, either. Lourdes had migraine headaches sometimes, and the Vicodin helped her, too. So in agreeing to fill some prescriptions in her name, Lourdes got to keep some of the pills for herself. Brad also talked with his office manager, Lori Espinoza, and he got her to agree to help him out with this by getting prescriptions in her name. He was also able to get the names and birth dates of some of her relatives to fill more prescriptions, some for Ritalin and some for Vicodin. So this is a slippery slope. Isn't it? Particularly Lourdes. She's an attorney. She was working for the DA's office, yes. So she knows that this isn't correct? Of course she does. She's in love. She's in love, and I just think she's not very honest. They did have an interview with her in the 48 Hours episode about this case, and I found her to be kind of deceitful, trying to project this innocent image of, you know, being in love with him and not really knowing. But she's an intelligent woman. She knew she knew very well what she was doing was wrong and yeah. dangerous. Right. So when Brad called in a prescription for Vicodin in Lourdes' name in August of 2001, suspicions were raised. The pharmacist thought it was odd that the doctor was picking up a prescription for his patient. Yeah, no kidding. Brad said, oh, she's at a wedding on that side of town, so I'll just pick it up and deliver it to her. Then when Brad arrived at the pharmacy to, to pick, the, pick up the prescriptions, the pharmacist asked for an ID. I left it in the car, Brad said, I'll be right back. So the pharmacist watched as Brad left the store and then just a few minutes later drove away without showing his ID or getting the prescription filled. Right. So with this obviously suspicious behavior, it didn't take long for the Drug Enforcement Administration to learn 
about Brad's illegal prescriptions. DEA agent Marcus Brown called Lourdes at home on October 22, 2001, hoping to set up an interview about the prescriptions that she had filled for Vicodin on June 24th and July 10th of that year. There was no answer, but he did leave a message for her, saying that he needed an interview with her regarding an important matter. The next day, Lourdes left a message on Brown's voicemail identifying herself as an assistant Pima County prosecutor and agreeing to an interview. The two soon agreed to meet in the Pima County Legal Services Building, where Lourdes had her office. Dave Wickey, another DEA agent, accompanied Agent Brown to this interview. So they asked her, are you a patient of Dr. Schwartz? She said, I see him informally. (laughs) Yeah. So the agent said, well, what does that mean? And she said, well, Dr. Schwartz treated my foster daughter, and he gave her some eye drops. So this was not going to cut it. Agent Brown asked her about specific prescriptions on certain dates, and Lourdes gave answers that were vague and even evasive. To most questions, she answered that she couldn't recall. So she suggested they go talk to Dr. Schwartz, as if they'd never thought of that, right? So she was asked not to mention this meeting to Brad Schwartz and told that she should inform her supervisor in the prosecutor's office about this. So Lourdes agreed. The agents left without believing that her memory lapses in relation to the prescriptions were legitimate, though. Then in December 2001, agents showed up at Brad's office. Oh, Brad was out of the office, but Brian was there. And it was apparent very quickly that he was surprised and alarmed at the DEA agent showing up at his office. Well, certainly. He had no idea, I guess. He'd been busy seeing patients, but the DEA agents demanded that every activity stop while they searched the office. That not only upset Brian and the patients, but it upset the medical staff as well. Now, unbeknownst to anyone else in the office, Brian had been having some serious issues while working with Brad, even before this DEA raid. He had been considering a return to Texas, but he loved Tucson and really didn't want to leave. So he began to consider setting up his own practice in Tucson. A fellow doctor and friend of his set Brian up with a practice manager who could help him transition into his own office. He even found a good space, a vacant office in in a nearby medical complex. Yeah, the DEA investigation added to the strain on Brad's already troubled marriage. In April 2002, Brad and Joan separated. Brad moved out of the home. They agreed that he would pay alimony and child support. And during this time, another legal matter came up. His wife, Joan, filed a lawsuit on behalf of Brad's practice against Lori Espinoza, saying that she had embezzled money from the business by cashing a check without authorization. Lori, in turn, filed a countersuit, saying that Brad had mistreated his staff. Eventually, both sides settled when Lori agreed to pay back the money she'd taken. And after Lori left, Brad called Carrie and asked her to drive down to Tucson from Phoenix because he was looking for someone to manage his office. Now, he introduced her to Brian Stidham, and Carrie saw that Brian seemed very polite and reserved. So Carrie was bothered when she heard that Brad was separated from Joan, and she felt like something was not right with Brad Schwartz. So she turned down Brad's offer to work with him. So then the DEA made contact with Brad in May of 2002, and he agreed to talk to them. He admitted to writing illegal prescriptions, but he tried to lessen the involvement of Lourdes and Lori Espinoza. But then on May 17th, Brad was arrested for shoplifting at the Tucson Mall. Other than a string of citations for running red lights, it was his first criminal charge. Now, Brad passed it off as a case of absent-mindedness, and the case was eventually dismissed. Well, during this time, Lourdes was trying to protect her interests in the DEA case, and she hired a very well-liked defense attorney and friend of hers. He called up the prosecutor, Russell March, with the U.S. Attorney's Office to arrange a meeting about her statements to the DEA the year before. So, her attorney told Marsh that Miss Lopez wishes to cooperate in this investigation. DEA agents Brown and Wickey came to Marsha's office then on July 18, 2002, to meet with Lourdes. Lourdes admitted to picking up just 10 to 20 pills 
back in June of 2001. Then she admitted to picking up 150 tablets of Vicodin that Brad had called in for her later that month. She said that her insurance paid for the prescription, but that she only used a few of the pills. Lourdes told agents that she knew she was going to share the pills with Brad before she went to pick them up. So this is a big deal. <laughs> this is insurance fraud as well. And 150 tablets. I've never heard of a prescription so large for something like that. Well, you never know when that pain's going to strike. Yeah, I guess so. Agents asked Lourdes if she knew that Dr. Schwartz had tried to pick up 100 tablets of Vicodin again in August in her name. And she admitted that she did know that, but she had never gotten any of the pills. So I guess that's okay not to mention it because you didn't get any? Well, that's what she's trying to <laughs> say, I guess. She's trying to protect herself. Yeah. Although Lourdes had promised to tell her supervisor at the Pima County Attorney's Office about her contact with the DEA, it wasn't until mid-July, after she'd come clean with the agents, that she bothered to notify her office. An indictment in federal court was coming at that point, so Lourdes couldn't hide her involvement any longer. The reaction from county attorney Barbara Lawal was quick and clear. You can resign or you'll be fired. So on August 2, 2002, Lourdes resigned as a deputy county attorney. And on September 26, 2002, she was indicted in federal court on four counts of helping Brad obtain illegal prescriptions. Yes, and I believe she was eventually disbarred. But oh, that, that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> no. Now, Lori Espinoza was indicted on 36 counts as well, and Brad Schwartz was indicted on 77 counts. Lori DeLorme, who had worked with Brad setting up the office in Tucson, heard about his indictment and decided to call Brad up to see how he was doing. I'm being set up by everybody, Brad complained, and I had nothing to do with any of this. But Carrie knew that Brad had once asked her to fill a prescription for him under her name, and she had refused him. She figured that if he had been taking the pills when he first got to Tucson, it must have been a chronic problem. On October 12, 2002, Brad enrolled in a 30-day treatment program at the Cottonwood to Tucson Rehabilitation Complex, and that's where he met Dr. Mark Austin, a specialist in addiction medicine. After Brad left Cottonwood, these two stayed in touch and became friends. Mark thought that Brad was a competent doctor, and he was so confident about his relationship with Brad that in December 2003, he loaned him $40,000 to be repaid with interest, with the final payment due in February of 2006. In January of 2004, Mark loaned Brad another $20,000 that Brad said he needed because he was divorcing Joan. As collateral, Brad put up his office building. Brad never missed a payment up until October 2004, and Mark also sold his Cadillac Escalade to Brad for $38,000. Mark believed that these loans were all safe because, after all, Brad was a successful surgeon whose income was on the rise, despite the setbacks in his personal and professional life. There seems to me at least some ethical problems with him loaning money. He was his physician at this clinic, right? Well, I don't know if he was his doctor. He met him at the place. He was a doctor at that clinic. He was, but I don't know if he was his doctor. Right. Yeah. I just, I'm bothered by this. Okay. Well, if you're bothered by this, just wait. Because okay. there's a lot worse coming around. That's nothing. More? Oh, All I got right. lots more. Let's go. So just hang in there, baby. So two days after leaving Cottonwood, Brad left Tucson for the Chicago-area Rush University Behavioral Health Treatment Program for doctors with addictions. Brad was really embarrassed by his addictions, and he lied to his staff and patients about the reason that he was going to be away for so long. Brad told them that he had a brain tumor and he needed surgery down in Florida. So that's a hell of a lie. Sure is. Now, because he would be out of work for several months, Brad turned to his parents and his ex-wife, Joan, to help keep his office running, while Brian handled seeing all of the patients while he was gone. Brad made arrangements for his father, Henry, to stay there for a month, and each morning, Henry Schwartz went to Brad's office to check the mail and find out anything important that needed to be passed along to his son in their daily phone calls. So one day, Henry was shocked to hear 
that Brian Stidham intended to open his own practice, and he was actually handing out his business cards to some of the patients. Brian even was trying to recruit some of the staff members to come with him. So Henry and Brad's mom, Lois, believed that Brian needed to be fired immediately. Yeah, I'm not real cool with that either. He's filling in for his partner to keep the practice going. And as he's doing that, he's saying to them, to the patients, if you want to keep coming to see me, I'm starting my own practice. Yeah, I agree. That's a little shaky. And handing out business cards. Yeah, he probably shouldn't have done any of that until he was out of that practice. I probably would agree. Yeah, but it really, really enraged Brad Schwartz and his parents as well, Henry and Lois. Yeah, it sure did. So Henry and Lois decided to break the news to Brad when they called him that night. And when he heard, Brad told them to bring Brian into the office for a call the next afternoon. So the next day, Henry and Lois consulted with the office manager, Lori Espinoza, who showed them the business cards that Brian had been handing out. Brian was called into Brad's office when Brad called that afternoon. Brian immediately admitted that he was starting his own practice, and he didn't fight the dismissal. All he said was, what about the patients? Because there were patients in the waiting room waiting to be seen. And Brad said, don't worry, if there's a problem, we'll tell the staff to send them to the hospital. But you need to pack your bags and leave. Anyway, just leave, he said. Don't take anything. We'll have anything that's yours sent to you. So that was the breakup. That was the breakup. Well, Brad's in rehab. Yes. So when he returned to Tucson, and this was mid-February 2003, uh, he was furious. And that's probably an understatement. He was furious at Brian for leaving the practice just when Brad needed him the most. Not only did Brad have to deal with his DEA case, but he had to try and save what was left of his surgical practice. And if he didn't have enough trouble, his relationship with Lourdes at this time was becoming more difficult. Both of their tempers were set off on June 24, 2003, when Brad was driving uh, with Lourdes in the passenger seat. He pulled over into the parking lot of a convenience store and tried to push her out of the SUV. Bystanders who saw this called the police, and both Lourdes and Brad were cited on misdemeanor domestic violence charges. Lourdes was still hysterical, even after the police had arrived. Yeah, now she notified her pretrial services officer at the federal court about the fight with Brad and her citation, and it was eventually dismissed. The officer suggested that Lourdes stay away from Brad Schwartz, though and a judge would later make that into a formal order. So she should have been getting a clue at this point that this was not a healthy relationship. There's plenty of signs there. So two days after that incident at the convenience store, Brad's attorney in a DEA case, Tucson defense attorney named Mike Picaretta, asked Brad to write up a letter explaining everything that had happened to him. Picaretta thought the letter could be useful to explain Brad's actions, if a trial came out of it. In this letter, Brad wrote that his former business associate, that would be Dr. Stidham, started his own practice while he, Brad, was hospitalized, and he took four of his full-time employees with him. He added that Dr. Stidham plotted with Lori Espinoza to get him credentialed on all health plans behind his back while Brad was hospitalized. Well, I don't know if that is really plotting. That's just something you need to do if you're starting your own practice. Yes, it is. Yes. Now, Brad was ordered to appear before the Arizona Medical Board to face the prescription drug charges. This was on August 14, 2003. He admitted that he used some patients to prescribe medicine for his own use. Now, in one case, he had ordered 1,200 Ritalin tablets for a mother and daughter who were patients and kept most of them for his own use. So he wasn't really cautious about this. That's a crazy amount of pills. Yeah, I don't know how he could order 1,200 pills at a time. I don't know. He also admitted to getting Vicodin fraudulently. It's been a long road, Brad told the board. I haven't seen any patients since October of 2002. I don't blame anyone else but me for my problems. No one forced me to take any pills. I've got a big problem, and I truly am sorry. Brad assured the board that he was fully committed to his recovery, 
including submitting to regular drug testing. So on September 11th, 2003, the attorney who Brad had hired to help him with his medical license proceedings, Craig Martin, told the board that Brad had been sober for two full years. In October, the medical board released its findings, noting that Brad's conduct could have harmed patients who put their trust in him. Remember, he was doing surgery. Now, the board ordered a decree of censure, putting Brad on five years of probation. While on probation, Brad was ordered to submit a statement under oath four times a year that he is complying with its orders. Had a year to complete the board's physician assessment and clinical education program in narcotics and medical records, was banned from prescribing or storing strong medications, and he had to enroll in the monitored aftercare program for physicians impaired by alcohol or drug use. Other conditions included going to group therapy once a week and attending 90 12-step meetings in 90 days. That's one a day, isn't it? Certainly is. And the board ruled that Brad could apply to prescribe medication after one year. The board ordered that Brad not drink any alcohol and that he submit to regular urine tests for drugs. And around this same time, Brian Stidham gave a deposition in a lawsuit involving one of Brad's former patients. The case involved a patient that Brian had seen initially and then had referred to Brad for surgery. Brian wrote that he had joined Brad in October of 2001, saw the patient in November of 2001, and the DEA raided the office sometime around December of 2001. So when you think about how quickly that all happened... You know, you have to think, well, maybe it wasn't that bad that he was handing out business cards and stuff because he'd just gotten there. And all this was breaking loose pretty quickly. Yes. He didn't know what ultimately went wrong, but he did believe that the patient in that case had a poor outcome. That could have happened. So in December of 2003, Brad agreed to plead guilty to 74 of the 77 charges. He could have faced up to four years in prison, and a fine of $250,000, but the judge decided to delay his sentencing for a year. Lourdes and Lori got similar deals. If all three defendants stayed out of trouble for a year, then the charges would be dismissed. Brad was ordered to pay a $7,500 fine, surrender his DEA registration to prescribe drugs, comply with all the conditions imposed by the Arizona Medical Board, and pay the government $40,000 as reimbursement for the costs of prosecuting him. Now, although Brad confidently pursued plans to rebuild his career, he held a grudge over what could have been if Brian and Stidham had not stabbed him in the back, figuratively. Lourdes encouraged him to let go of his anger and move forward, but Brad seemed unable or unwilling to do that. Yeah, now Brad knew it would take some time to repair his career since his license was suspended, but he really wanted to get things up and running and prepare for the time when he could practice again. He thought about how Carrie DeLorme had set up the APES office when he first arrived in Tucson, so he called her up. And Carrie was surprised to hear from him. Brad was still furious with Brian Stidham. Remember Brian Stidham, he asked her? Well, I come back from rehab and there are no patients. Brian's gone and took him. Carrie had seen Brad very angry before, but she was really taken aback by his attitude toward Brian. Eventually, Brad got back on track and offered her a job setting up and managing his new office. Carrie turned him down as politely as she could, not wanting to burn any bridges. Yeah, but she really didn't want to work for him. No, he he had problems. He certainly did. A handful of Brad's employees had gone to work for Brian, but there were still a few who planned to go back and work with Brad when he was ready. One of those was his physician's assistant, Nader Shami. Nader began working for Brad back in 1999. Before Brian arrived, Brad was seeing at least 60 patients a day. In 2001 and 2002, the two doctors saw about 60 to 80 patients a day. In late 2002, after Brian left and Brad went into rehab, Nader took another job and he only occasionally did work with Brian. One year later, when Brad's practice was back up and running, Nader returned to work with Brad because he liked that position and he enjoyed working with Brad. 
he'd never seen Brad improperly prescribe medications, scream, or throw tantrums. Occasionally, he had seen Brad get angry if he noticed sloppy work, but Nader believed that Brad just wanted things to be done right. Sure. So he had kind of a different image of Brad than most people. He does. So in September 2003, Brad's practice was pretty slow, slower than it had been before. By mid-2004, business started picking up. Brad was seeing 25 to 30 patients a day. Nader spent more time with Brad than any of the other employees. He was aware that there was a break between Brad and Brian. He never heard anything negative from Brad about Brian. Brad had plans to expand his practice to include some cosmetic procedures. He agreed to have an esthetician come into the office to offer Botox and other facial treatments, which would definitely bring in more profits to his practice. Brad set aside an area in the office for this and then began buying the equipment that would be needed. Now, Lourdes was at a grocery store on the south side of Tucson when she saw an old friend, Rosalia Humo. Brad Schwartz had performed eye surgery on Rosalia a few years back. When Rosalia told Lourdes that she didn't have a job, Lourdes told her that Brad was back in town and restarting his practice. She said that he might need someone to do billing and she suggested that Rosalia give him a call. Rosalia wasn't really interested in working for Brad. Does she have a history with him? She had surgery with him. So Rosalia didn't call. In late November of 2003, Brad tracked Rosalia down at her grandmother's house. Rosalia didn't want to talk to him and tried avoiding his calls, but he persisted and Rosalia returned the call in January 2004. Come to the office, Brad said. I'd really like to see you and talk to you about this job. So when I think about this, I'm thinking, did Lourdes know why he wanted to talk to Rosalia? Because we're going to find out he wasn't really wanting to talk to her about a job, at least not a job in his office for her. So for whatever reason, Rosalia was hesitant to go and see Brad. She asked her friend Margaret to come along with her to Brad's office. Brad greeted the two women in the lobby and asked Rosalia to step back with him in the exam room because Rosalia had asked him to check her eyes. While alone with her, Brad told her that he had a huge problem and he needed help taking care of it. So Rosalia asked him what the problem was. Brad asked her if she remembered the doctor he had been working with, Brian Stidham. He said that Brian was the problem. He had practically ruined Brad's life, he said and he needed help getting him out of the way. He suggested to Rosalia that she could plant child pornography in Brian's office to get him into trouble. (laughs) He even volunteered to take a photo of his son naked for her to plant in Brian's desk. Then he said maybe they could plant some drugs in Brian's office as well. He stole my patients, Brad said. When I was in rehab, I lost half my patients and half my staff to Brian. You know, I pulled him out of Longview, Texas to come here. I paid a hundred and twenty grand to relocate him. All I asked for was a little loyalty, and at the first sign of trouble, he splits and takes half of everything with him. He doesn't know how much harm I can cause him. I know where he works. Do you think you could find somebody, one of your gang members, to kill him? Rosalia had tattoos from her early years when she was a teen she was in a gang. So that must be what had given Brad the idea that she would know killers. But actually, she was shocked. And Brad said to her, I want him fucking dead. So Rosalia told Brad, let me see what I can do about it. (laughs) But she wasn't sure if he was serious or not. But he sounds pretty serious. And this will be a recurring thing where he says things like this to people. And they say, oh, we can't be serious. And nobody tells anyone. Right. No one warns Brian. No one calls the police. It's just so frustrating. Well, and all Rosalia wanted to do was get out of there. Oh, absolutely. But before she left, Brad told her that after it was taken care of, he might have a job for her in his office. So a little quid pro quo there. Yeah. You help me take care of my problem and I'll hire you. Thinking it over later, Rosalia decided that Brad couldn't have been serious. So she didn't make any attempt to find anyone who might actually follow through with Brad's plans. She hoped that Brad would forget about it. But after a few days, calls started coming in from him again. 
Brad wanted to know if she found someone to plant the pornography or someone to ambush Brian at his office. Rosalia put him off as much as possible, saying, well, I'm still trying to find someone. And then eventually Brad stopped calling her. Brad had to submit to urine testing, not only for the federal court, but also for the state medical board. There was a lab corp testing facility near his office, so that's where he'd go for this. And one of the first people Brad met there was Carlos Ogus, a muscular guy who'd been a phlebotomist there for about three years. In the process of getting all the paperwork done, Carlos and Brad would talk when Brad came by. Carlos confided to Brad about how he'd been having trouble with his eyes. So Brad had said, come to my office, I'll see you no problem. So Carlos did go, and he got a free eye exam at Brad's office. Brad prescribed some glasses for him. Then one day in the summer of 2004, Brad came into LabCorp and asked to talk to Carlos in private. Carlos agreed. He was really curious about what Brad wanted. But Brad said, Carlos, do you know anybody who can take care of somebody for me? I'll pay them. So Carlos, he knew what Brad was getting at, and he said no. And that was the end of the mm-hmm. conversation and the relationship right then and there. Yeah. So, smart guy. Then in the summer of 2003, Lourdes and Brad were going through a, a breakup, which was their pattern. Break up, reunite, and so on. When she called a friend to her house, Lourdes told Jeff Fairbanks that Brad sometimes said he wanted Brian Stidham killed. She asked Jeff if she should call Brian and warn him. Jeff for his part, couldn't believe that Lourdes was still in contact with Brad Schwartz. Jeff believed that Brad was evil and just basically an all-around bad guy. Do not have anything to do with him. Yeah, so Lourdes never did call Brian, and Jeff didn't either. Within weeks, Lourdes and Brad were back together again and talking about getting married. Lourdes even told Brad that she would convert to Judaism for him. So Brad signed them up for classes at the Jewish Community Center, so Lourdes could learn about Judaism. She especially liked learning about the holidays, especially Yom Kippur. It's about letting go of the anger that you have in your heart, Brad told her, to let God allow you to have peace. So one night as they're leaving class, Lourdes took Brad's hand as they walked to the parking lot, and she said, what a great class. Brad nodded and agreed with her. You know, Lourdes said, Yom Kippur and what it stands for. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Brad. But then Brad started to get angry. He said, what the fuck are you talking about? About Brian, Lourdes said, about letting go of the anger. But you know, Brad was not having that. Fuck that, Brad said. He pulled away from her and he said, you don't understand, Lourdes. You just don't understand. I have to piss for pretrial services. I have to fucking meet with them. I have to do what the fucking medical board tells me. I fucking hate my mom and dad. I have to go to rehab. My practice went to shit, and I'm going through a divorce. I don't know what his mom and dad have to do with it. But he was just blaming... probably didn't give him as much money as he wanted. Right. But he was just blaming everything, every single thing on one person, and that was Brian Stidham. And over the next few months, Brad asked several people if they could help him hire someone to take care of Brian Stidham. Many of these were women he was sleeping with, although he was still involved with Lourdes. Now, his relationship with Lourdes was a complex one because of his affairs and their legal issues, but also because being with Lourdes meant dealing with her past. In November 2003, her ex-husband Danny called Lourdes and begged her to help him when he was arrested for drug possession. Lourdes did. She bailed him out. Then the following month, Brad gave Danny $5,000 in cash. Then in February, one month after Brad and Lourdes became engaged, Danny came to Tucson to see his children that he had had with Lourdes. He also took a friend in to see Brad about his eyes. While he was in Tucson, Danny promised to take the children back with him to Nebraska to see his new baby for the first time. But at the last minute, he told Lourdes he was not going to take the children to Nebraska. So Lourdes was pretty angry with Danny for getting the kids' hopes up and then leaving without them, but it might have been good. Well, yeah, about one month later, when Lourdes and Brad heard that Danny was killed in a shootout with the police, Lourdes was thankful that he hadn't taken her children with him. But Danny's death had a really odd effect on Brad. 
Now that Danny has been killed, Brad said to Lourdes, and I see how much his children miss him, you know I just have to let my anger go. So Lourdes was thrilled to hear Brad say these words. She knew that it was hard for Brad to swallow his pride and let his anger go, and she was really relieved, thinking they could put the whole Brian Stidham thing behind them. But unfortunately, Brad's newfound forgiveness didn't last. He and Lourdes broke up for good in May of 2004. Then Brad was involved with a married woman he had met in rehab named Aisha. That summer, Brad asked Aisha if she could get her husband, Dallas, to do a favor for him. Brad had met Dallas when he and Aisha were both in rehab. Dallas was a stocky guy, about five foot seven, weighing about 200 pounds. Brad said that he would pay Dallas to hurt Brian. So Aisha was upset by this and told him no. But Brad didn't give up. He said, oh, come on. I know you guys need the money. It'll solve all of your problems. I'll give you $1,500 before and $1,500 after. So all he has to do is beat Brian up, Brad said, crush his hands in some way so he wouldn't be able to operate anymore. Or he could throw acid in his eyes, put him out of his career that way. So Brad went on to tell Aisha that Brian worked in an office complex where there weren't any security cameras. So Dallas could jump him after he got off of work. Brad even offered to give Dallas some latex gloves so no fingerprints would be left behind. He said he also had some acid, if that's what Dallas wanted to do. He'd even given Dallas some medical scrubs that he could wear when he did this. Aisha tried to reason with Brad. She told him that having Dallas do such a thing would not only put him at risk, but her and her child as well. But Brad continued to press her on this for the next couple of weeks, and she finally relented. She agreed to ask Dallas for what Brad wanted, and she accepted the $1,500 from Brad because she and Dallas really needed the money. They were behind on their rent. Dallas also wanted to buy a gun for his protection because the store where he worked got robbed often. But she had no intention of asking Dallas to hurt Dr. Stidham. She looked at the $1,500 as a loan, and she intended to pay it back as soon as possible. She wasn't sure how she's going to explain to Dallas how she'd gotten the money. Just one minor problem. Yeah, and of course Dallas was immediately suspicious about the money. When Aisha told him how she'd gotten it, he was really upset. Aisha told Dallas that she would repay the loan to Brad somehow. So she called Brad with the bad news the next day. It's not going to happen, she said. We changed our minds. It's just not something that we want to get involved with. But I'll pay you back soon, I promise. Dallas is just about to start another job, and we'll get the money back to you very soon. But not surprisingly, Brad was furious. Part of Aisha felt sorry for Brad and wanted to comfort him, but another part knew that this was just one of his manipulations. She spent the next few weeks avoiding Brad's calls. He always asked for the money back, and she knew that they wouldn't be able to pay him back any time real soon. And Aisha wondered if she should tell the police about the threats against Brian, but she decided not to. They all did. She was afraid to go to the police, especially since she'd agreed to help Brad, and she didn't have proof of anything, so it would be her word against his. Aisha talked herself into believing that it would do no good to tell the police or to warn Brian about Brad because he wasn't really serious about hurting him. Now, if someone actually pays you cash, I think they're serious. I do, too. So in late June of 2004, Liliana Bibb was on the dating site Match.com when she came across Brad Schwartz's profile. She sent a message that she was interested in meeting him, and Brad responded quickly. So the two arranged to meet for coffee. The first meeting went so well that Liliana felt comfortable asking Brad to come to a 4th of July party at her house the next week. Before long, the two were lovers. They met for lunch often, and Brad sent roses to her every week. She wasn't expecting it when Brad proposed to her within a few weeks of their date. Liliana didn't seriously consider the proposal, but she did continue to see Brad. Yeah, one evening Liliana was spending the evening at Brad's apartment watching TV when he exploded into a rage after getting a phone call. Brad slammed the phone down and told her that a deal he had went bad and he had lost $1,500. Oh, so we know that what would that's be about, the Asia deal, yeah. 
They changed their minds, he said, and explained that he had loaned money to a woman he knew named Aisha, and she had given him her wedding ring as collateral. But now the woman was reneging on the deal that they'd made. Now Liliana wondered if the deal that had just gone bad had anything to do with Danny Lopez, because she hadn't known Brad too long before he told her about Brian Stidham and how Brian had ruined his life. I want him gone, Brad said. I want him hurt. I wish he could have his eyes poked out or his fingers broken so he can't perform surgery anymore. I'd be happy if he was six feet under. If Brian couldn't practice medicine anymore, Brad told her, he'd get all his patients back. So isn't it interesting how obsessed he is with this one person? Yes. Yeah. Know, and, and from what we hear, he was heading in the right direction. Yeah, his practice was getting better. He was dating. You know, he was always dating, I guess. But he hadn't even been working with Brian that long. So it right. doesn't seem like that huge of a betrayal. It's not someone you worked with for 20 years. No. So it's just interesting to me how obsessed he got with that one man. Brad told Liliana that he had hired Danny to kill Brian Stidham. Remember, Danny was Lord as his husband. Ex. Ex-husband. Yep. But then Danny had gotten himself killed before he could carry out the contract killing. One night, Brad had driven Liliana past the First Avenue Medical Plaza and told her that Brian had his office there. Brad had pointed out how dark it was in the complex at night and that there were no cameras. Brian left his office late at night through the back in the alley, Brad said. I want it to look like a robbery there. On more than one occasion, Brad had asked Liliana if she could find a hitman. She couldn't imagine why someone would say such outrageous things to someone he'd really only known for a few weeks. But Liliana figured it was because he trusted her. But soon she found out that any trust she had in him was misplaced. Brad was seeing other women. Once she followed him because she was sure he was lying about where he was going, and then she watched as Brad met up with Lourdes. Another night, Liliana caught him in another lie when she burst into a restaurant close to Brad's apartment and confronted him at a table with another woman. Liliana made such a scene that time that the restaurant staff had to escort her out. Early in their brief relationship, we got to remember, this was a brief relationship, yeah, weeks. Brad had called her constantly. But by August, the call stopped. Liliana was jealous. She confided in her co-workers about the relationship, and they all urged her to stay away from Brad. But Liliana assured them that his plot against Brian was just talk. Brad's not serious about doing any of that stuff. Liliana was angry that Brad was ignoring her, and she called him repeatedly, but he wouldn't return her calls but she decided she knew how to get his attention. She called his number and left him a message saying, I have somebody for you. <laughs> Brad called her back right away. You know, when they spoke, Liliana demanded money from Brad. She needed $350 to pay her rent, and then she would talk to him. Brad told her he didn't have any money, but she didn't believe him. He said he was going broke. But the fact that Brad was a surgeon, owned a Cadillac Escalade, owned his own building, and lived in a nice apartment in a good part of town made Liliana doubt that he had no money. So Brad gave in and gave her the money. And then she just never spoke to him again. <laughs> so, so he wow. must have found someone else anyway, because he didn't try calling her back. But he always had several women. Well, you know, you got to. You got to have backups. So as crazy and out of control as Brad's life was, Brian's was going in the opposite direction. His practice was thriving. And not only had Brian been able to keep up some of his previous patients, but his popularity among the local medical community was so good that other physicians gave him a lot of referrals. So things were going so well financially for the Stidhams at this point, they hired an estate attorney to draw up a living trust. And around the same time, they took out a $1 million insurance policy on Brian's life with Daphne as the sole beneficiary. Yeah, but still, because Brad Schwartz did have some skills that Brian didn't have, hospitals and physicians still referred some patients to Brad at Arizona Specialty Eye Care. So it was inevitable that these two surgeons would cross paths occasionally. And when they did, nothing more than casual hellos were exchanged. There was no you know, obvious aggression. 
and Brian just tried not to think about the past. But still, there were rumors that Brad was still upset about his falling out with Brian. Dr. Kevin Concanon ran into Brian one day at the Tucson Medical Center in the spring of 2004 and noticed that Brian was really on edge. That's when Brian confided to him that he was worried about Brad Schwartz. He was hearing that Brad was out to get him and might even want him dead. But Kevin thought about it and told Brian, you know, that's just ridiculous. Brad's odd, and he did have those issues with drugs, but Kevin said, I don't think Brad is violent. Still, Brian wondered if he should be taking the rumors about Brad more seriously. After all, Brad thought that Brian had taken his pediatric patients, and everyone kept telling him that Brad was really angry with him. So Kevin said, oh, Brian, I just don't think that's realistic. I know there are murderers out there, but cold-blooded killers? It's just not what I'd expect from him. Brad's an educated man. He's got children. People like that just don't go around killing people. So Brian asked, well, should I go to the police? But Kevin told him that he didn't think the police could do anything about it. And going to the police might just make Brad angrier if he was to learn about it. So Kevin told Brian that Brad would get over it and not to worry about it. So that fall, Brad's operating privileges at Northwest Hospital were reinstated, though he would still have to wait for other hospitals to do the same thing. Brad's attorney in his case with the state medical board told Brad that once the DEA cleared Brad for full prescription writing abilities, the other hospitals would welcome him back. Brad had kept up with his obligations set by the federal court and the medical board. He never missed a drug test and never came up positive for drugs or alcohol. He continued to go to counseling and missed only a few meetings for, you know, with good excuses like an illness or a family obligation. A few of the health insurance companies also had agreed to cover Brad's patients. So each month, more and more patients were coming back to Brad's office. He was making plans to expand his business and really building a new life. He even had a new home in a bedroom community southwest of Tucson. So in early September 2004, Tucson Medical Center sent a patient to see Brad for an injury to his right eye. Brad performed eye surgery on this patient, Bruce Bigger, on September 15th. So do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Bruce Bigger, Dick? Sure. He was actually Ronald Bruce Bigger, but he went by his middle name. Another one. Must be popular. He moved to Arizona in the late 1990s. Now, Arizona was a big change from where he'd grown up in northern Indiana, and it was a great place to escape his problems. Well, maybe for a while. David and Mary Sue Bigger had only one child. That was Bruce. When Bruce was about four years old, David Bigger was critically injured after the train hit his car. David lived on for months, and his son often visited him at the hospital. But eventually, David Bigger died from his injuries that he had suffered. He had been a manager at a local credit union, and they were conducting an audit at the time of his accident. And it was discovered that David, who had been an alcoholic, had been embezzling money from the bank. Though the official manner of death was by accident, many people suspected that David Bigger committed suicide by parking his car on the railroad tracks. Well, we don't know if that's true. Sometimes, Bruce told friends, he suspected his father was being chased by someone who caused him to drive in front of the train. So Sue raised Bruce alone for two years on her salary as an officer from the LaPorte Police Department until she married a man who had no children of his own. He was both physically and emotionally abusive, though, to Bruce. That marriage lasted just five years, and Sue filed for divorce. Growing up, Bruce did have many friends. He was athletic, playing on the high school football and wrestling teams. He liked to read, especially about his favorite subject, sports. When Bruce was 15, his mom married a man named Chris Yadavia, who had two sons of his own, and the boys all got along well. Now, Bruce considered Chris his father, even though the marriage to his mom only lasted three years and Sue would blame Chris's lack of anger management for their divorce. So it's hard to say what really happened there. But at age 18, Bruce enrolled in college, where he got a partial football scholarship, and he dreamed of becoming a short story writer. The freedom of living away from home proved to be too much for Bruce, however, and he got heavily into partying. 
At age 20 in 1997, he transferred to another college where his football career ended after he was injured in a car accident. By then, Bruce knew he had a problem with alcohol and drugs. While hospitalized for his car accident, Bruce asked whether someone could force him into drug treatment. Now that same year, his grandfather died, and Bruce ended up dropping out of school and never got a degree. As an adult, Bruce seemed to be able to talk his way out of any situation. Working in sales suited his personality, and he did really well. The problem was Bruce had no common sense when it came to handling his money. He spent money as soon as he earned it, or he gave it away. Bruce spent all of an inheritance his paternal grandfather had left him, too. And then Bruce was dealt another blow. His father's grandmother and great-aunt became ill in 1998, and Bruce was really close to them. He did whatever he could to help them, but then they both died around the same time which sent Bruce into a downward spiral. He went to counseling for the first time, battling severe depression. Bruce also began getting DUIs. In 2004, Bruce was arrested for forgery after writing a fake check. Anxious to get a fresh start, he took off for Tucson, Arizona. Bruce had about $2,000 on him and figured he could get a job easily when the money ran out. He drove to Tucson in his mother's car and had no problem finding new friends and a place to stay. But months passed and he didn't find a job. He began to live on the streets, and he was using drugs again. Tucson police were dispatched around 4.30 in the afternoon. September 4th, 2004, in regards to a report of an assault at a Circle K convenience store. A 19-year-old man, David, reported that he and his girlfriend, Una, were walking into the store when another man confronted him and punched him in the head several times with closed fists. David fell to the ground and was kicked in the ribs. Una ran into the store to ask the clerk to call 911, and then she watched as the stranger yelled at David, who was trying to get up. The clerk actually got between the two men and ordered the stranger to leave. A surveillance tape of the incident showed David pushing the stranger back, and the stranger was lunging for David when the clerk came between him. David was taken to a hospital for treatment, and the suspect left in a white SUV. Minutes later, the officer who responded to the store was told by the command center that a man named Bruce called in and was mumbling incoherently about the incident at the Circle K. However, the officer was unable to find Bruce or locate the SUV the suspect left in. But the clerk had written the license plate number of the SUV down, and an officer was sent to the address where the vehicle was registered. A woman said the car was her estranged husband's, and told him where he is now living. And the husband told the officer that a friend of his had borrowed the SUV and left a note saying he was going to walk to Walmart. But when the friend came back, he was upset. He said he got into a fight at the Circle K. Police traced the suspect's identity back to Bruce. The police then issued a stop and arrest order for Bruce on two counts of assault. He was arrested two days later. Bruce claimed that David began the fight and was mad because he had gotten beaten up. On September 9th, police were called to an apartment in Midtown Tucson reporting that a man and a woman were yelling and things were being thrown around. When officers arrived, they found Bruce Bigger. He was sitting on a couch, bleeding from his face and head. Bruce told them that he'd been sleeping on the sofa when two black men came inside, woke him up, and said, You hit my sister. I've never hurt a woman in my life, Bruce said, he told the men. The larger of the two men began hitting him, Bruce said, and the men left in a blue Ford Escort. So paramedics were called and treated Bruce for cuts over his right eyelid, the back of his head, his left forehead, and on his nose. Bruce was arrested but released because he had head injuries and was taken to the Tucson Medical Center. He was referred to Dr. Brad Schwartz for an eye exam. So Bruce was seen on September 9th entering Brad's office with a swollen black and blue face. Twelve days later, Bruce was in trouble again. 
He was riding with three friends when an undercover officer noticed the car running without a light over the license plate. Uniformed officers pulled the car over. The driver said he was borrowing the car and didn't have insurance papers or a registration. A records check showed that the man was driving on a suspended license. Bruce told an officer that they had been at a friend's house, and the only thing of his in the car was an Altoids tin. Officers searched the car, and they found a crack pipe in front of the front passenger seat, and that's where Bruce had been sitting. So Bruce was charged with possessing drug paraphernalia. On October 5th, 2004, Dr. Brian Stidham woke up at 5 in the morning, his normal hour. This day, for the first time in several months, Brian decided he was going to lift weights before work. At 7.20 in the morning, Brian left his house to go to the office. He had set up his practice in a medical complex on North First Avenue. Brian's morning was filled with patient visits. He managed to get in a call before 1 in the afternoon to his wife Daphne at home. Daphne wanted to bring the children in to visit for a while, so they made arrangements to do that. Brian usually left the office before 5 in the afternoon, if not sooner. But on this night, Daphne knew that he was staying late to lecture a group of medical students. So while Brad was seeing patients, his new girlfriend, Lisa Goldberg, was preparing to drive to Tucson. At noontime, Lisa put her overnight bag, her dog, and a study guide for a real estate exam in her car. Lisa was scheduled to take the exam the next day in Tucson, and she planned to have dinner with Brad that night. She arrived in Tucson around four in the afternoon and drove straight to Brad's office. She parked around back and left her dog in the fenced-in area. Brad explained that he was still seeing patients, but Lisa could hang out with his new esthetician, Julie. Julie gave Lisa a tour of the office, and after Julie was finished showing Lisa around, Brad was still busy seeing patients, so Julie and Lisa went to Starbucks for a coffee. Now, at the Starbucks, Julie asked Lisa about her relationship with Brad. When Lisa said that she and Brad were dating exclusively, Julie corrected her, filling her in on how Brad was never faithful to anyone. So he's definitely lying to her. Unsure what to think, Lisa was confused and on edge. Lisa and Julie returned to Brad's office around 5.30 in the evening just as Brad was finishing up. So Lisa followed Brad's Escalade back to his apartment where she could hang out while he was at a 6 p.m. counseling session. She decided not to say anything to Brad about her conversation with Julie until later. Lisa took advantage of Brad's absence to do a little snooping around his apartment. She saw that his computer was on sleep, and thinking she could get directions on where the real estate test was being held the next day, she tapped on the space bar to get the computer screen back on. She saw that the last thing Brad was looking at was an internet dating site for Hispanics. She felt like she had no option but to bring up the subject of his unfaithfulness to her after he got back. When Brad got back to his apartment around 7.30, he and Lisa changed clothes and headed out to a Thai restaurant. Before they left, Lisa asked him if he was seeing other women. He said he wasn't, and when she brought up what Julie had told her, he said that Julie had no idea what she was talking about. So Lisa was still pretty skeptical. Yeah. She should have been. Absolutely. Now, as was the norm, Brad's phone was frequently ringing, and after one call, he told Lisa that it was from a friend from rehab who was having car problems. Brad told her that he was helping this guy out, so he asked her if it was okay if he met them for dinner at the Thai restaurant. So Lisa wasn't happy about this, but she did agree. Tom Boger, a cab driver, had just begun his night shift when he decided to drive out to an all-nude strip club, Bunny Ranch, where it was usually easy to pick up some fares. As soon as he pulled his van into the lot, a man who had just crossed the street and was out of breath flagged him down. This was Bruce Bigger. Bruce got into the back seat of the cab and said he needed a ride to the restaurant. The driver asked the name of the restaurant, but Bruce didn't know. So the driver let Bruce use his phone. And after the phone conversation ended, Bruce told the driver where the restaurant was located. Now Brad saw the cab approaching the restaurant and stood up. 
When Bruce pulled up, he asked Brad for $20 to pay the cab fare. By this time, Lisa had a really bad feeling about the whole thing. But Brad asked her for the $20, so she handed it over. Then Brad led Bruce to the back of the small restaurant, where Lisa was seated. Lisa, Brad said, this is Bruce, Bruce, Lisa. And Bruce smiled at Lisa. Now she recognized him as a man who was waiting in Brad's office lobby when she arrived at the office earlier that day. She didn't remember anything about Bruce's behavior earlier, but she thought he was acting very agitated now. She noticed that his pupils were dilated and he was sweating. So Lisa thought he could have been on drugs. She looked down at his hands and noticed that his fingernails were very dirty. So she wasn't impressed with this guy. Not in the least. Brad and Lisa had been finishing their dinners when Bruce arrived, so Brad allowed Bruce to pick through and eat their leftovers. Brad then called the waitress over and asked for the check, which he paid with a credit card. The three then got into Brad's Escalade and headed back to Brad's office, where Bruce said he had left his bike. And then Lisa heard Brad say to Bruce, Hey, how'd those scrubs work out for you? Just great, Bruce said. Then he turned to Lisa and gave an explanation. I wanted to go horseback riding and I didn't have anything to wear, so Brad gave me some scrubs. Horseback riding, Lisa thought. I mean, this was just too weird. She knew something was really shady here. No kidding. So Lisa stayed in the Escalade after they arrived at the office while Brad and Bruce went to the back where Bruce's bike was, and they brought it back to the Escalade. The plan was to take Bruce to a hotel, but as big as the Cadillac Escalade was, the bike wouldn't fit in the back. So the two men took the bike and left it in the backyard. Then back in the car... Lisa was too tired and fed up to pay much attention to what they were saying to each other. So instead of going straight to a hotel, Brad drove to an ATM. Once again, Lisa stayed in the SUV while the men got out. And after a few minutes, they returned. Brad was kind of miffed. There's only $20 in my account, he said. I just sold a car, and I was hoping that the funds had cleared, but I guess they haven't. So isn't that strange for a surgeon to not have $20? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why would he have to sell a car to have any money? It's just strange, the whole thing. Well, nothing that's making any sense. No, no. Brad then drove to a hotel, hoping to get a room for Bruce. Lisa again chose to stay in the SUV. The first two hotels they stopped at had no vacancies, but a clerk gave them the number for the residence inn, and that place had some vacancies. Lisa was relieved when Brad returned to the SUV alone at the residence inn. Then Brad drove Lisa back to his apartment. That evening, October 5th, the Pima County Sheriff's Department responded to a report of a man down in the parking lot of the North First Medical Plaza, where Brian Stidham had his practice. Christine Rotella, a massage therapist, had returned to the medical complex where she had forgotten her engagement ring in her office. She didn't want to get her ring all gunked up when she was giving massages, so she always removed it before her client sessions. But after getting home that night, she told her fiancé that she had left her ring behind. So at about 10 p.m., Christine and her fiancé, Anthony, drove back to the medical complex to retrieve the ring. But as Anthony pulled his truck into the parking lot of the complex, his headlights illuminated what looked like a man in scrubs lying on the pavement. It was Brian Stidham, lying face up with his arms and legs outstretched. Anthony rolled down his window and called out to the man. He motioned for Christine to stay in the car while he got out. On the pavement, he saw papers strewn about. He cautiously approached the man, speaking more loudly, but the man did not respond. So Anthony nudged the man's shoulder with his foot. Still no response. So realizing that something was really wrong and not sure how he should proceed, Anthony got back in the truck and told Christine that he thought the man was dead. Christine had trained to be a lifeguard and she knew CPR, so she got out of the truck and checked the man for a pulse on his wrist, while Anthony called 911. Within minutes, around 10.30 p.m., a Tucson police officer arrived on the scene. Soon, deputies from the sheriff's department arrived at the complex. Within an hour, the dark parking lot was illuminated by bright lights, A large section was taped off, and the area was surrounded by deputies and detectives. Some news people had heard about the suspected homicide as well, 
and had sent some crews over. Near the body, deputies saw a car registration renewal form. It was torn a little bit and stained with blood. It was for a white Lexus. But there was no matching car nearby. The name on the form was David Brian Stidham. The same name was stenciled above an office door just about 40 feet from where Brian's body was. Of the dozens of murders in Pima County each year, few of them involved someone like Brian Stidham. He didn't live a risky lifestyle. It seemed obvious to the deputies and detectives at the scene that the young doctor was a victim of a carjacking because his car was gone. So word was sent out immediately for law enforcement officers across town to be on the lookout for Dr. Stidham's white Lexus. So Brian's lying face up. His head was pointing in the southwestern direction, with his arms and legs spread out on the pavement. His glasses, spattered with blood, lay on the ground beside him. So paramedics arrived at the scene and confirmed that Brian was dead. Two deputies checked all the doors in the complex looking for unlocked doors or people. One officer noticed that there was one door to an office that had earlier been dark, but now appeared to have a light on. So he knocked on the door and was greeted by a woman who identified herself as Dr. Tili Kulatalaki. The doctor explained that she had been in her office for most of the day, but that she'd left around 3.30 in the afternoon to go to Walmart in order to get cleaning supplies for the office aquarium. She brought the cleaning supplies back for the staff, then left for a medical appointment. She returned around 6 p.m. Now, around midnight, four deputies showed up at Brian and Daphne Stidham's house. There were no cars parked on the street. The deputies knew that Brian drove a Lexus. They rang the doorbell, which they could hear echoing throughout the house, but there was no response. One of the deputies tried calling a phone number given to them. He got a busy signal. Orders were sent to call Quest to interrupt the call, but Quest said the equipment that could do that to cut in was broken. A deputy turned the doorknob, and surprisingly, it was unlocked. So he slowly opened the door. Uh, It opened about an inch and a half before the security chain stopped it. Checking around the outside of the house, a deputy was able to push open a door to the three-car garage, where a Lexus SUV was parked. The deputies called in the license plate number, which did turn out to be registered to Brian and Daphne, but this wasn't the Lexus that they were looking for. A detective arrived and told the deputies that his supervisors gave permission for them to enter the home, so the deputies entered the house through the unlocked door from the garage. Then, the four other deputies entered the house through the laundry room. To the right, there was a double-door entrance to the master bedroom. They searched the kitchen and the family room. Then they cautiously opened the door to the bedroom. Peering inside, they saw a woman sleeping on her back on the right side of the bed. A deputy shined his flashlight on her and shouted, Pima County Sheriff's Department, ma'am. So the woman slowly opened her eyes, sat up, and asked, Is my husband okay? Was he shot? So this was surprising. And when asked, Daphne said that she had asked that because Brian had not come home. They were a little suspicious because she had their estate planning documents beside the bed, which showed that $1 million life insurance policy they'd recently bought on Brian's life. But then they would eliminate her as a suspect. She didn't look where her husband should have been sleeping. She just hopped out of bed and walked to her dresser. The deputies asked Daphne for some ID and they walked with her to the kitchen where she found her purse and sat down on the floor, rummaging through it for her driver's license. Sitting at the dining room table, they told Daphne that Brian had been murdered. She broke down sobbing and asked if she could call some family members. Why did the most horrible things happen to the nicest people, she asked, looking up at the deputies and smiling sadly. She continued trying to reach her family by phone without success. And she repeated, why did the most horrible things happen to the nicest people? The detectives asked Daphne about Brian's practice. Daphne told them that in December it would have been Brian's two-year anniversary at his new office. She said that there was one guy who had made threats against Brian. That was Brad Schwartz. Daphne said, Brad has told Brian, I'm going to kill you. The detectives asked if there were any legal problems between Brian and Daphne. 
if either had filed for divorce or accused the other of abusing the children. Daphne insisted they hadn't had any problems like that. Daphne's phone showed that the last call from Brian came in to her at 5.36 in the afternoon. I think Brad Schwartz killed him, Daphne said, according to detectives' reports, because he's a little psycho. He had a bad problem with drugs. Uh, my dad said that you can treat patients with seizures, but uh, people like that, their brain doesn't work right. Now, Daphne's father was a neurologist, so I, I will take what he says at face value. <laughs> Okay, well, after they interviewed Daphne, the lead detective wrote down his observations and impressions of what had happened to Brian. During the majority of my interaction with Daphne Stidham, he wrote, she appeared to be rather calm and did not cry from what I saw. The only time she appeared upset was upon the initial notification that her husband was deceased. The remainder of the time, she appeared to be calm and very lucid. Every deputy who entered the Stidham's home that night believed that Daphne either killed her husband or had something to do with his murder. And that's according to the official reports. But they were wrong. She was eliminated as a suspect, and from that night on, the focus of the murder investigation turned to Dr. Bradley Schwartz. Yeah, I guess she just didn't act the way she's supposed to act, right? Right. She, that, that happens. She was too detached. I guess so, but she was woken in the middle of the night. Right. Now, about six hours after Brian's body was found, a team from the medical examiner's office arrived to transport him for an autopsy. The autopsy would show that Brian had been stabbed 15 times, and it was believed that he died just before 7.30 p.m. Now, this was based on the time he left his office building after giving a lecture to med students, as well as the medical examiner's opinion. By daylight, the deputies and detectives were finished documenting whatever evidence they had found in that parking lot. The fire department was called in to wash away the blood that had pooled beneath his body, and this was just as office workers began arriving for the day. While many of them didn't arrive in time to see the deputies, they knew something was wrong because police tape was still wrapped around a trash bin and some trees near where Brian Stidham had been found. So by morning, Dr. Sidham's staff were already aware of his death. His office manager had been called by deputies around 2 in the morning to give them the alarm code to the office so detectives could determine whether anything leading up to his death had started inside the office. The office manager sent word to the other staff members, and they called others in the local medical community. So by noon on October 6, 2004, pretty much anyone in Houston who knew Brian... It's not Houston. God damn it. Almost everybody in Tucson who knew Brian had learned that he had been murdered. Brad Schwartz was in surgery on Wednesday mornings, which included the morning after Brian was killed. But he talked to two staff members separately, both of whom told him about Brian's death. Brad appeared shocked to his employees when he heard the news. So Brian's funeral was held in Tucson. Many patients' parents took the hand of Brian's mother, Joyce, and tearfully told her about how Brian had saved their child's eyesight. Often, some parents added gratefully, he did it for free because they couldn't afford the surgery. In the days following the murder, the residents of Tucson talked about who could have been the killer. Many were afraid because the killer was still on the loose. Some in the community thought they knew who had killed the kind and popular children's eye surgeon, though. Yeah, that was the consensus, wasn't it? Yeah, well, people that actually knew Brad and the whole situation. Yes. Now, Brad's esthetician, Julie Harrington, was getting her 10-year-old daughter ready for school when she heard the news that morning that a man was found murdered the previous night at a medical complex on North First Avenue. Julie had come to know Brad pretty well, and Brad liked to talk. And Julie had heard about the issues Brad had had with Brian Stidham a couple of years earlier. She also knew that Brian had an office on First Avenue, so the news that a man was killed in that area really concerned her. Brad had confided just about everything in his life to her. He had told her about his problems with the women he was seeing, but Julie thought Brad had spoken very little to her about Brian Stidham. Julie wasn't even sure what kind of relationship the two men had had, other than that they were former colleagues. When Julie arrived at the office around noon on the 6th, Brad was already there. 
he broke the news to her that Brian Stidham had been killed. Julie told Brad that she had heard that Brian had been shot, but then Brad corrected her. Brian was stabbed to death, not shot, he said. Before long, Brad excused himself. He said that he had errands to run, including going to the bank. And that is where he withdrew $10,000. And just minutes later, he called up Bruce Bigger on his cell phone. So did anyone take note of this discrepancy or the fact that Brad seemed to know how Brian had been killed? They didn't really know that until afterwards because she wasn't aware that it wasn't public information. Okay. But it would be significant later on. Sure, it would be. So in addition to trying to calm Julie's fears, Brad had to deal with Lourdes, who was growing increasingly suspicious of him. Over the next couple of days, Brad called Lourdes frequently, and the conversation was always the same. He would try to convince her that he had nothing to do with Brian's murder, but she just wanted him to stop contacting her. She didn't tell him that she was thinking of going to the police because she was now afraid of him. So Tucson police officer D.E. Martinez was cruising through the Midtown area as part of Operation Safe Streets and was helping to search for Brian's missing car. He was passing through the southern parking lot of the Bellevue Tower Apartments when he spotted a 1992 white Lexus SE400 with a license plate matching the one belonging to Brian. Unmarked units from the Pima County Sheriff's Department were dispatched to the scene immediately to begin surveillance that would last throughout the night. Yeah, what they did is undercover deputies stayed and kept an eye on the Bellevue Tower apartments all that night, just in case the killer decided to return. No one ever did approach the vehicle, so the surveillance was called off the next morning. The keys were in the ignition and there was blood on the driver's side of the car, both inside and out. There was also a cell phone in plain view. Brad had called Lisa Goldberg, his date from the night of the murder, and told her that Brian had been killed. On Tuesday night, he said, remember Tuesday? That's the night we went out to dinner at Karuna's. So he was reminding her that she was his alibi. Lisa asked Brad if he had anything to do with the murder, but he denied it. So at this point, she was trembling. Lisa was afraid. She hung up the phone not wanting to hear any more details, because now she felt confident that Brad and Bruce were behind this murder, and she'd been with them that night. It's scary (laughs) to think about. Isn't it? Yes. So she's really the only one that could recognize Bruce as being someone that was with Brad that night. Yeah. So I would be afraid, too. That'd make me a little cautious. Absolutely, yes. So Brad tried calling her back, but Lisa refused to pick up the phone. She curled up with a pillow, sobbing as he left message after message for her to call him. She was terrified. She kept replaying Brad's conversation in her mind and going back over their steps that night. That Bruce guy they had met up with had creeped her out, and Brad had spoken to her about having Brian killed more than once. So she's sort of putting two and two together. Yeah, it's easy to do at this point. It's very simple. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, really. At 11.30 that evening, Lisa finally summoned the courage to call the Pima County Sheriff's Department. She was put in touch with Sergeant Faust, whom she told about her fears that Brad Schwartz might have had Brian killed. Lisa told Faust about having dinner that night with Brad's friend Bruce and how they had held conversations out of her earshot that evening. Other ex-girlfriends of Brad Schwartz called into the police to report that Brad had hated Brian Stidham. He had told several people that he wanted to see Brian six feet under. According to office manager Lori Espinoza, Brad Schwartz had a wandering eye and many lovers. In fact, when patients came in, office staff had been instructed to let Brad know if the mother of the child was a GLM, a good-looking mom. And, if she was, they knew to give him extra time alone in the exam room. Espinoza estimated that Brad who had been married and had three children, had slept with at least 50 different women. Sometimes he had even had sex in the office. And I don't mean at night, I mean in the middle of office hours. Espinosa would put her ear to the door and hear sounds of him having sex with a woman, and then the staff would just say, there he goes again. So it was well known. Yeah, just one more thing that tells me what an upstanding human being Brad is. Yeah. 
So Lourdes Lopez, the ex-girlfriend who had been an assistant DA when she met Brad, called the police to tell him what she knew. She admitted that she was in love with Brad, but that he had been falling apart for the last several years. He would fall asleep in his car and arrive late for surgeries. In 2001, he had chronic back pain and has taken 20 to 30 Vicodin every day. It had been just four weeks after Brian joined the practice when the DEA raided Brad's office. By all accounts, Brad's life had been quite unstable, and by August of 2003, Brad had his license to practice back, he had hospital privileges, and he was rebuilding his practice. Patients were coming in, and he was off the drugs. But he had not let go of the anger he felt towards Brian Stidham. Yeah, the murder investigation was absolutely focused on Brad Schwartz, but he did have an ironclad alibi. He had been with Lisa Goldberg all evening. But Lisa had become suspicious when Brad called her the next day and told her about the murder. Some people who came forward told detectives that if Brad was going to kill Brian, he would hire someone to do it for him. So they had to wonder if Bruce Bigger was Brad's hired killer. Brad Schwartz's cell phone records were subpoenaed, hoping that there would be calls to Bruce Bigger. But the records instead showed calls to and from a convenience store. But the bombshell here was that the store was less than 400 feet from the murder scene. Records showed that Brad had called the payphone there just minutes before the murder. The clerk at the store was interviewed, and she described a man who had come into the store that night and who had been acting very agitated. She said that the man came in wearing scrubs, and he walked around the store looking for something. Then he used the phone, which was very unusual. The man was wearing light blue surgical scrubs, but he did not look like Brad Schwartz. This reminded the detectives of a strange question that Lisa Goldberg had heard Brad ask Bruce Biggers on the night of the murder. Remember, he had asked, how'd the scrubs work out? So investigators believed that the man wearing the scrubs was Brian's killer. They looked for a connection to Brad, and they caught a break when one of Brad's employees gave them the name Bruce Bigger, who was a former patient who had been injured in an assault at the Circle K convenience store. Bruce had a record and a mugshot to show to the store clerk. When the clerk was shown a photo lineup, she picked the photo of Bruce as the man who had been in the store wearing scrubs. Then hotel surveillance footage had captured Brad Schwartz and Bruce Bigger looking for a room. However, Bruce checked out before the police could get to him. Meanwhile, Lisa Goldberg is terrified, thinking she's going to be the next victim. I don't blame her. No. So it was ten days after the murder when Bruce was finally arrested. He'd been hiding just outside of Tucson. Later that same night, Brad was arrested. He was found in bed with a new woman. Both Brad and Bruce were charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Not long after the arrests of Brad and Bruce, the sheriff informed the media that the murder of Brian Stidham had been solved. TV cameras rushed to the sheriff's headquarters to take pictures of Brad being led into the building. This was his perp walk. Brad was held in jail while he waited for his trial to begin. And at trial, the prosecutor, Sylvia Lafferty, showed that Brad had received calls from a payphone across the street from Brian's office building. Brad's cell phone had also received calls from Bruce's hotel room, which Brad had paid for with his credit card. There was also video footage from the bank showing Brad cashing a $10,000 check. Looking at his cell phone records, investigators were able to determine that Brad Schwartz had been calling Bruce Bigger's hotel room while he was at the bank. So what they think happened is that Bruce was trying to contact him, and then once Brad had the money, he'd called Bruce at the hotel room. Now Lafferty also brought up the long-held grudge Brad had against Brian Stidham. Many people took the stand, including ex-girlfriends, friends, colleagues, and they all told the jury that Brad had often talked about how much he hated Brian. Of course, another big part of the prosecution's case was the DNA evidence from Bruce Bigger which was found in Brian's car. Yes, some of his DNA was found actually on the radio knob. 
So does that mean he was listening to the radio when he moved the car? I don't know. Sure. Could have been. So the trial lasted two months, and the jury deliberated for five full days. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Brad Schwartz was convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison for conspiracy to commit murder. He never took the stand in his defense. Bruce Bigger's defense was that it was Brad Schwartz who actually committed the murder. As a backup defense, they also brought up another potential suspect, a man named Dennis Walsh, who was a convicted carjacker who had used a knife before. But, That's interesting. Yeah, but really not significant. But lead prosecutors were able to bring in a more sophisticated DNA analysis. The state's expert testified that the odds of the DNA in the car belonging to someone other than Bruce were 1 in 20 million. Also, two of Bruce's drug-using friends took the stand, and they testified that after the murder, Bruce Bigger had a lot of cash on him. The trial revealed that Brad Schwartz was an extremely manipulative man, and there was some sympathy for Bruce Bigger, but the evidence was overwhelming. Bigger was found guilty of both conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and to first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance for parole. Almost immediately after the trials, both Schwartz and Bigger filed appeals. Bigger's appeal was based on his not getting a fair trial due to all of the media coverage on the case. Schwartz's appeal is based on there being newly found evidence in the case. Both convictions were affirmed by the court. Now, once in prison, Brad Schwartz repeatedly made the news. In 2009, he claimed to have been attacked by his fellow inmates. He was injured and he had facial fractures that would require plastic surgery. Also, which is kind of ironic, his vision was permanently damaged. I guess that's not ironic. That's just interesting and coincidental. Right? I think it could go for ironic, too. Really? Okay. Yeah. One of his things was throw acid in Stidham's face to blind him. <laughs> True. So. Yeah. A lot of eye things going on in this story. Yeah. An inmate was convicted of aggravated assault for beating up Brad Schwartz. Brad's attorney attempted to sue the state of Arizona for compensation for repeated attacks by inmates, but this was not successful. So when you think of why other inmates were attacking him, you have to look at his prison record because he had many infractions. So I think he was making trouble and probably pissing people off. Mm -hmm. So arrogant, you know? I think that's a good observation. I think so. But, you know, to me, the whole timing of this murder is very strange. When Brian was killed, Brad was apparently doing better. He was off drugs and the business was growing again. But it had been a couple of years since he had dealt with Brian. So I just have to wonder why he was so obsessed with hating Brian and trying to kill him. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, he just let his anger and hatred get to him and took a life and threw away his own life. And what about his kids and everybody? He hurt a lot of people. So before we move forward with feedback, I'd like to let our listeners know that we've added an additional benefit for our True Crime Brewery premium subscribers. So now you don't just get bonus and ad free episodes you also get the episode a day early. So you get your ad-free versions of the show on Sunday nights, and then we release the show as normal on Monday nights. So if that interests you and you'd like to support the show, please go to tigrabber.com forward slash subscribe. Or if you prefer, you can also get these same benefits by going to patreon.com. Also, just a reminder that you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com or leave us a voicemail from your phone or computer by clicking on the link in our show notes or by going to our website, tigrabber.com. You can also help the show if you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you listen to us. However you support us, we do appreciate you and we thank you for being here with us at The Quiet End. Yes, uh, we're deeply appreciative. It's time for listener feedback. I've got three voicemails and one email for you today. Elizabeth is first, and she's actually going to give us two case suggestions. So this is a twofer. 
Okay, so our first voicemail is from Elizabeth. Hi, Dick and Jill. This is Elizabeth from Terre Haute, Indiana. I've been busy binge-watching, or rather listening, to your podcasts. But I was wondering if you had done a session on uh, Diana Lovejoy, L-O-V-E-J-O-Y, out of Carlsbad, California. She had hired a hitman to kill her husband. Thankfully, he survived the shooting, and she and her accomplice were convicted. I just hadn't ran across that, and I was just uh, wondering on that one. Then, I am keeping an eye on the pediatrician, Dr. Stephanie Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, out of Louisville, Kentucky. She's um, got a murder-for-hire plot against her ex-husband last year, so she hasn't gone to trial yet or anything, um, which could be, I think it was delayed indefinitely for a mental evaluation on her. But it's been, it was kind of (laughs) interesting. So that's all. And I I love you with your podcast. You guys are great. And I just want to say thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now that's two cases that sound like they're right up our alley. Yeah, they both sounded pretty interesting, especially the pediatrician. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's interesting. And that's pretty recent. Yeah, that's within the last year or so. So might be some time before we do an episode on that. Got to get through a court. Sure. Okay. But we'll look into that. And then we have another voicemail from Nancy and Kate. Yes. This is, I thought, pretty sweet. It's a mother and daughter. Let's hear it. Hello, Jill and Dick. Hi, Jill and Dick. We have a murder for you today. Um, <laughs> it was happened in Abington, Pennsylvania. That's our town. Um, but um, the victims were Reed and Miriam Beck. Um, they were dismembered by their daughter, Verity? Verity. Verity, okay. Um, now she is in the Montgomery County Correctional Facility. And we don't have many details because we just saw it, but you can just Google it. And I let my daughter listen to the podcast with me because it's appropriate and you're not too gory. And I don't allow her to listen to anything too upsetting. And your voices are very calming. For that, we are grateful. And. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, but your con- your podcast is great, and it helps us get to sleep, because I cannot sleep, and you can't either. You're up at 3 a.m. all the time. And, and yeah, thanks. Bye. Well, thanks, Nancy and Kate. That was adorable. It's pretty weird to hear that sweet little voice say dismembered. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like she's emotionally healthy, so I'm okay with it. Sounds like a good mother-daughter relationship to me. Right? Yeah, it's good to have something in common. So what about this case, Verity Beck? Well, she's a 49-year-old woman who I believe was living with her parents. She's been charged with killing both parents. I believe one parent, her mother, she dismembered and her mom was found in eight bags. And I think that the, her father, she had beheaded him but hadn't done any more dismemberment of him. So, wow. Do we have a motive here at all? No. And this isn't really a young person. It's a 49-year-old. And if it was just for inheriting their money, she didn't have to do all that. So, I'm really curious what was going on in her brain. Besides mental illness? Well, sure, but there are a lot of mentally ill people that don't hurt anybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the Montgomery County District Attorney said in a press conference that she was trying to get rid of the evidence because she put the body parts in trash cans. But she was present inside the home when officers entered the property following a call from a concerned family member. So they called for a welfare check, and she's in there. So, yeah, there's something seriously wrong with her, but definitely an interesting case that we'll look into. So thank you, ladies. We'll find out. Yeah. One more voicemail. Another voicemail. Wow. From Darlene. Okay. Darlene's got some comments to make. Hi, this is Darlene from Canada. I just started listening to your podcast recently and loved it so much that I went and subscribed to your premium feed. What a great relationship you two have that you can be partners in life and discuss true crime. And you guys have such a great banter between the two of you. Anyhow, just wanted to pop in and uh, say how much I really love listening to it. I love the research you guys put in. I love the the longer length of your episodes. It's a great attraction for me. So anyhow, I look forward to listening to more from you uh, in the future here. Thanks so much. Well, aw shucks, Darlene. Thank you. That's so flattering. I appreciate that. 
Okay, now we do have one email. I know you like getting emails. and uh, I like voicemails, too. Your friend Nate, who you adore, yes. has a case suggestion. So if you want to read it. Okay. Your loyal fan Nate here. I was wondering if you could cover the Samuel Scheinbein case. It started in Maryland with two teenagers committing a heinous murder. One of them was caught and took his life before trial, and the other fled to Israel where he took a plea deal and was incarcerated in an Israeli prison until he tried to escape and was shot dead. Lots of twists and turns in this case. It hasn't received a lot of podcast coverage, so I thought you might find it to be interesting. Hope you two are doing well. Well, thanks, Nate. What do we know about it? Well, just briefly, Samuel Scheinbein was an American-Israeli convicted murderer. September 16, 1997, Scheinbein who was then a 17-year-old high schooler, and Aaron Benjamin Needle, a former classmate, killed Alfredo Freddy, Enrique Tello, Jr. Then they dismembered and burned the corpse. Scheinbein fled to Israel, where he was eligible for citizenship under the law of return. And at the time, Israeli law prohibited extradition of Israeli citizens. That is interesting. So the, the case, as you might suspect, uh, strained U.S.-Israeli relations a, a little bit and prompted an overhaul of Israeli extradition policy, which now requires a defendant seeking to avoid extradition to also demonstrate a residential connection to Israel. So the Washington Post wrote that it became a sensational legal tug-of-war involving Congress, the state and justice departments, and the upper echelons of Israel's political and judicial establishments. All right. Well, I think we'll look into that one. Thank you, Nate. Looks pretty interesting, doesn't it? Absolutely. And even a big-time ending. Scheinbein was sentenced to 24 years in prison in 1999. In 2014, he was killed in a shootout. Right. He was trying to escape. With Israeli police special forces in Ramoina Prison. And this was after Scheinbein had shot and wounded six officials and another prisoner with a gun that had been smuggled into the prison. How do you do that? That's scary, isn't it? So he, he went out in a blaze of bullets. He certainly did. Yes, he did. Well, thank you so much, Nate and Darlene and Nancy and Kate and Elizabeth. Did I get everybody? You covered them. All right. And let's get some more feedback coming in. That's right. Let's go, listeners. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you next time at the quiet end. Got some seats down here. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.